ambulance. What is your emergency? Uh, I need an ambulance. Uh, In what city? I just got beat at the back of our bar. He's bleeding from his nose, his eyes. He's beaten really bad. A steel worker out on a Friday night with his wife and teenage son takes a trip to the bathroom that turns out to be fatal. Whoever did this took it away from me. The victim is found in the back hallway of a blue collar bar. He's been savagely kicked and beaten. They turned on him like, uh, you know, rabbit dogs. Attempts to revive him fail. I can still taste his blood in my mouth. Who has committed this brutal attack? Why was Art Rosendahl targeted? He was a good brother-in-law, a good father. Why? Hamilton, Ontario, a city built on the steel industry. It's also the home of Art Rosendahl. Art was your typical Hamilton guy, you know, steel worker, you know, had a regular blue collar job and lots of friends. Art and his wife, Brenda, have made a home for themselves and their sons, Jordan and Neil, here on Hamilton Hill. He was very caring. He had a great sense of humor. Yeah, he was a very mellow person. I married my best friend and my lover. When we first got married, it would be like, there's the happiest couple in the world. I took very ill in 1991, I had a twin aneurysm, and like, he performed CPR on me until the ambulance and the fire department came. He renewed our wedding vows in front of our friends and family because he said he was blessed to have me still alive. He adored her, I think. Made the rest of us look <laughs> like cavemen. Our last Valentine's Day, he was dressed as a knight in shining armor with the chain mail. And when he did that, I knew how much he loved me. There was actually one time where my dad took my mom out into the street in their pajamas, dancing by the lamppost. If you are not smiling around him, then he had to make you laugh. Art's first love is his family, but his second love is cars. Buicks were his thing, old Buicks. But he always had his boys in the garage with him. I'd help with sanding and stuff like that. From an early age, he and I got into cars, and we had an old Valiant here on the farm that had quit. And Art and I got that thing running. When we were 10 years old, 11 years old, we actually got the thing to run and uh, started driving around the farm in it. He was a good friend to everybody, and that's why it makes it so hard to understand what did happen to him. January 14, 2005, a bone chilling minus 16 degrees. At the end of a long week, Art, Brenda, and Neil head out to O'Grady's, their local pub. Everybody knew everybody. It was like a neighborhood bar where you'd go and you'd at least know f two or three or five people. We didn't go out very much during the week of Christmas, so we missed a lot of people. So we decided to go out that night to see friends that we hadn't seen at Christmas time and like, you know, have a drink and talk about what we all thought the year was going to bring. It started out as a Friday night like any other. There was a lot of laughter. We danced and, and Neil and Art played pool. He was very good at pool, I can tell you that. He wouldn't go easy on me, but at times, I know he let me win. He was thinking about my feelings instead of making me feel like, oh darn, I suck. Around 10.30, Neil leaves to pick up his brother from work. I ended up chugging one and running out saying, Dad, I will be back, I'm going to get Jordan. My dad kept on saying, what, you're pulling out of a good pool game? Art heads to the bar, just as the DJ starts up some tunes. He was talking with a friend of ours, so I asked him if he wanted to dance. He goes, I'll do the next one. So I got up with a, a friend, and we're on the dance floor dancing. Then he went to the washroom. The next few moments are a mystery. I had a waitress come up to me on the dance floor and told me that Art had been beaten up. She didn't say how bad. Brenda is unprepared for what awaits her in the back hallway. It was a shock, because I was expecting a bloody nose, not somebody who was laying on the ground, not moving, not breathing. We rolled him over, 
His face was black, badly swollen. His eyes were swollen shut. He had blood coming out of his mouth, his nose, and his left ear. And he wasn't breathing. Brenda tries to breathe life into the man she married 20 years before. I cleared his mouth to breathe for him. I can still taste his blood in my mouth. The bartender calls 911. I need an ambulance. Uh, and what city? Got beat at the back of our bar. He's bleeding from his eyes. Oh, what is the address? 592 Upper James. Okay. The guy doesn't have a pulse anymore. Constable Michelle Berry is one of the first officers to head to the scene. You're just thinking you're going and it's another simple disturbance at a bar. You don't realize what you've got until you get there. She arrives to find paramedics desperately trying to jumpstart the victim's dying heart. At that point, we had an officer that had already been with the victim. Even though we deal with, you know, crimes on a day-to-day -day basis, it still affects us emotionally as people, knowing that, you know, you attend there, you're giving um, a, an innocent victim CPR and he doesn't make it. It's traumatic. At 11.14 p.m., Arthur Rosendahl is pronounced dead. He is 44 years old. In Hamilton, Canada's steel town, Art Rosendahl, a steel worker and a 44-year-old father of two, heads out for a typical Friday night with his family and friends at their local pub. While his wife, Brenda, takes a turn on the dance floor, Art goes to the bathroom and never returns. Art Rosendahl is found bleeding and motionless in the back hallway of the bar. Brenda tries to breathe life back into her husband, but he's pronounced dead at 11.14 p.m. What happened in those few minutes in the bathroom that would provoke this ruthless and fatal attack? The assault against Art Rosendahl has now become a case for the homicide unit. Staff Sergeant Peter Abi Rashed will oversee the investigation. Once the words homicide were said, I realized that we gotta get things going. To find out who's responsible, the police need to piece together what happened at the bar that night. And with over 50 witness statements to take, it's a challenge. Detective Greg Jackson pours through each of them. When I heard about what had happened and the fact that uh, his wife had, uh, was there and had tried to perform CPR on him, I was, I was shocked. The priority for police is to find someone who witnessed the deadly attack. The bar was full. There's a lot of people there drinking and having a good time. Unfortunately, where it actually occurred, it was in a small hallway uh, towards the back of uh, the premises. The hallway to the bathroom is far from the eyes of the bar patrons. What happened in that back hallway? Did it start in the bathroom? No one knows where it started. Out in the bar, people are having a good time until one man heads into the back hallway. This eyewitness sees Art Rosendahl down on the ground, surrounded by three black men. Two of them are attacking him, while one stands back and watches. He's taking blows to the head, and he's being um, kicked and stomped on the back. Art is a big man, but he's defenseless against this attack. The person who saw Arthur in the back in the back hallway described them as being almost in a, in a uh, I guess you call it a fetile or a um, turtle position, trying to protect yourself as best you can. Art can only curl up and hope for an end to the assault. Well, you got a, one person who's trying to protect themselves, and you got two people that we can say for sure are kicking and stomping on the person. The eyewitness tries to stop one of the men who wears a vicious looking metal grill in his mouth. He's kicking him in the head and he kicks him twice in the head. He actually kicks him the one time and then Mr. Eckhart says to him, I think he's had enough and then he gives another kick in the head. The man with the grill pushes the eyewitness against the wall and then the men flee. Though only one person saw the attack, many people in the bar had noticed the men. Apparently, you couldn't miss them. They're boisterous, they're loud. They had that attitude of, uh, you know, the tough guys in the bar. The three men had actually been playing pool at the table next to Art and his son. The only words that we had with them were, would you like to take a shot? Are we in your way? Later in the evening, the men would argue amongst themselves just before they went into the bathroom. There was um, 
what appeared to be a dispute amongst the individuals, not Mr. Rosendahl. No one has any answers as to why Art Rosendahl became the target of the men's violence and rage. This was a brutal, brutal, vicious attack that made no sense whatsoever. To try to make sense of it, Abi Rashed calls in veteran detective Mike Maloney, who takes on the role of primary investigator. That evening, uh, it was Peter on the phone, and typical Peter says, uh, we got one. Of course, on your way, and you're thinking, holy geez, what, what has gone on? What has happened? So these are the things that go through your mind uh, as you're driving in. He will dig deep to see if there is more to this homicide than meets the eye. Was it mere coincidence that put Art in the bathroom with his attackers? My first instinct would be, was it a drug deal gone bad? At the station, Maloney has some tough questions for Brenda and her son, Neil. You want to ask everything. Is your husband a drug user? Did you know these people? Did Art have anybody who didn't like him? Would he be one to start a fight? Why do you think that they did it? Maloney wants to know why Neil left the bar right before Art was attacked. Why did you leave? Mike can be um, very in your face when the time uh, calls for it. They actually kept on asking me why I left in several different questions. Like they were trying to catch me slip or say something wrong. You have to get the information. Maybe Brenda Rosendahl had a motive. Were there money problems or relationship issues? Considering a wife watched her husband take his last breath, she was quite competent with all of her answers and everything that was going on. I was kind of amazed by uh, how she handled it. Maloney ratchets up the pressure to test her. Are you sure you had nothing to do with this? Could Brenda have hired the killers? I looked at my two sisters. I said, they think I had something to do with this. So we do have to ask those hard questions. And after hours of interviewing, Mike Maloney's gut tells him the family had nothing to do with Art's death. This lady's just watched her husband die, and she has to answer that question from me. You feel for them, and uh, it's a very awkward situation. So I think through interviewing her and her son, uh, we understood that this was just something that took place. Here was a fellow that was a hardworking uh, contributor to society and basically somewhere there everything went bad with the family ruled out detectives conclude the murder is chillingly random they're pretty let's put it this way very hard, hard to solve when they're random there's no pattern there's no place to start we need somewhere to start and also for the public it's it's random it could be you myself it could be anyone it's after midnight in steel town just a couple of hours since Art Rosendahl was brutally beaten to death at a roadhouse in Hamilton, Ontario. Friends and family there with him had no idea Art was being attacked in the back hallway of the bar. He went to the washroom and never came home. The lone witness to the beating describes two black men mercilessly kicking the victim while a third looked on. The police can find no personal motive behind the killing and have deemed this a random attack. With no motive and no leads, it's hoped that forensic detective Annette Hughes can dig up some clues. My coworkers lovingly call me Forensic Barbie. In the 175 years of the Hamilton Police Service, I'm the first uh, and only female that they've ever had in the forensic unit. And this will be her first case as lead forensic investigator. You want to have that opportunity for the first time to put all your skills to the test. And when you're the lead on a homicide, you're definitely putting your skills to the test. You don't want to make a mistake because a mistake affects your victim's family. It's your average normal family. And to know that, you know, their routine of a Friday night could turn into a nightmare. For me personally, it pulls on your heartstrings. It's 11.45 p.m., just half an hour since Art Rosendahl's murder. Annette Hughes heads to the hospital to collect evidence from the victim. In this case, it could be a particular challenge. Knowing when a victim's going to the hospital, they're being transported in an ambulance, they're going into an emergency room, there's a lot of opportunity for evidence to get lost. So we were directed into the uh, trauma area where uh, 
he was taken. We took photographs and collected the clothing that had already been removed from him. Anytime there's an altercation, there's an opportunity for the uh, victim to maybe scratch, punch, grab hair. And, and what we do is we take sterile bags and uh, secure them over top of the hands. The pathologist at the morgue does a full examination of the body, bruising at the neck, the face, the chest. X-rays reveal three broken ribs, injuries consistent with an eyewitness account that Art had been repeatedly kicked. Then something unexpected, prominent and oddly shaped bruises on Art's back and side. There are actually two marks that were unusual or we couldn't quite figure out how they were caused. One was in the middle of his back and it was two concentric circles with these lines around the circles. The other area was on his side and it was a series of clear lines. Those markings on his back were um, a little puzzling, a little confusing. They were inconsistent to what an assault would have caused. When we have something in front of us that uh, we can't explain right away, we have to put uh, some effort into getting that answer. I want to know how did that bruise get there and what caused it. If the mark remains unidentified, it could raise questions about the cause of death and get in the way of proving murder. Definitely, we need an answer for court. Annette Hughes goes to the bar to search for the source of the bruise and other forensic evidence. The crime scene is being recorded on police videotape. This is my first opportunity to see the crime scene. We call it a walkthrough. There were several beer mugs, shot glasses. That was really important evidence for us to collect. The attackers didn't have the knowledge or the forethought to think, we got to wipe off these beer bottles and get rid of them before we leave. Any beer bottle, any drink container, any shot glasses put up to someone's mouth, and uh, we know we're going to get DNA from it. Hughes checks out the hallway where the attack on Art Rosendahl occurred. There was uh, EMS debris, uh, some gloves, cigarette butts. Hughes scrutinizes everything, looking for what could have caused the unusual bruising on Art's back. We were thinking maybe something he was pushed against, fallen against at the scene might have caused the uh, injuries. There were a couple of doorways in the back hallway um, with doorknobs that we thought maybe could explain the circular pattern. But the cause of the bruise remains elusive. Nothing, nothing at all. No, it was frustrating. Then Hughes finds something in the hallway that could be a key piece of evidence. There was a broken chain with a dog tag that uh, said Damien P on it. And just from where it was located in the hallway, I mean, one would naturally assume that it had been pulled from someone in the struggle. In his hometown of Hamilton, Ontario, steelworker Art Rosendahl has been beaten to death in a blue collar bar. His wife's attempts to save him have failed. I can still taste his blood in my mouth. His body tells a brutal tale, one that contains many questions. Those markings uh, on his back uh, were um, a little puzzling, a little confusing. Only one man witnessed the brutal assault by three black men, but many bar patrons had seen them earlier that night and are able to provide descriptions. As the city sleeps, dozens of officers continue to prowl the streets looking for the suspects, one of whom wore a distinctive dental grill, according to an eyewitness. But prospects for finding these men are slim to none. Usually when they run away from the, the first arrival of the police, you don't catch them. Shane Groombridge is among the many officers scouring the city in search of the assailants. So I responded to the area, um, searched for them for approximately half an hour, um, couldn't find them. So I parked my vehicle at uh, Brantdale and West 5th. At this point, I didn't feel the suspects were still in the area. I figured the suspects had plenty of time to make good their escape. Groombridge is thinking about heading back to the station when he sees a potential suspect. I observed um, a six foot black male wearing dark clothing. At that point, I noticed he had a silver grill on his top teeth. Was this the assailant with the distinctive gangster accessory? In Hamilton, it's very rare. And when the officer came across him, there's the grills. When Groombridge asks for ID, all hell breaks loose. Basically asked me if he was under arrest, and I immediately said yes, because from experience, if someone asks you that question, you don't arrest them, they're going to flee. And he struggled, so I grabbed hold of his shoulder 
and he just pulled back and the next thing we're struggling, we're on the ground, um, rolling, and I was able to get on top of him, get his arms pinned down. Backup arrives and the suspect is taken into custody. Cairo Sparks, a 23-year-old from nearby Kitchener, Waterloo. Hotel 352, suspect under arrest. 10 4. Sparks is put in holding, but the staff sergeant has his doubts about whether they've got the right guy. It did not make sense. This was um, sometime after the actual assault, and yet he's arrested within a block of where it occurred. For someone to do this kind of damage to another human and then stay within the air was unusual. If Sparks is innocent, he should have nothing to hide. Annette Hughes requests his clothing to test for forensic evidence. My normal procedure is to go in, introduce myself. I'm in the forensic unit. I'm going to need to take your clothing. But Sparks refuses to let her near his clothes. You can forget it, bitch. It's not happening. And um, he started to come towards me in the cell area. And I, I felt like I just got out in time. And he was spitting, kicking, punching, hitting the door, yelling. Yeah, he was out of control. Even when we told him that he was gonna, we were going to use a taser if necessary, he said, bring it on. It doesn't scare me. We opened the door. He charged at uh, the officers. He was tasered. He went down quite rapidly. As soon as it was disengaged, he became violent again. He was warned. He was tasered again. The bottom metal plate from his mouth come tumbling out across the uh, cell floor and sort of right to my feet. So that was the first uh, piece of evidence that I uh, collected from him. And he finally complied, and we took his clothing. Hughes then thinks she knows why Sparks didn't want to comply. She's handed a pair of very incriminating shoes. I looked at the shoes, and um, just from my experience, what I was seeing on the shoes was blood. I figured that the blood that's on the shoes that I'm looking at are, is the victim's blood. She'll have to wait for DNA testing to find out if she's right. Hopefully it's Art's blood, we'll get a DNA match. I thought, perfect, we've got evidence to this assault right on his shoes. Abi Rashed and Maloney now pay Cairo Sparks a visit. He is charged with second degree murder. Perhaps that may cause him to utter something to us. With the eyewitness report and the blood on the shoes, police hope to leverage a confession out of Sparks. Maybe he'll give up the other two men who were in the hallway but Sparks has nothing to say. It's basically the attitude of, prove it. Um, I didn't do it, wasn't there. But proving it might be harder than any of the detectives can anticipate. Hamilton, Ontario, January 15, 2005, the morning after the brutal murder of Art Rosendahl, a husband and father. The Hamilton Homicide Unit has questioned and cleared the family. Police believe that Art Rosendahl did not know his attackers. The murder was frighteningly random. It could be you, myself, it could be anyone. The motive remains a mystery, and though there is one suspect in custody, he isn't talking, and two other men seen by an eyewitness are still at large. The next morning, when Brenda Rosendahl wakes, everything seems normal for a fleeting moment. I got up in the morning, and I put on the tea kettle, and I, made, I actually made two cups of tea. That's when I realized what actually really did happen to Art, because he wasn't there, and that he was not coming home. At 7 o'clock, Brenda begins calling Art's best friends. I couldn't believe it. it took me a long time to even accept it. Time right after Art died in the next few days uh, is more of a blank than anything. It doesn't take much to uh, well up the emotions. Then she calls the foreman at the mill to tell him Art won't be coming into work. They said, is he sick? I said, no, he's dead. And the phone just dropped. Before long, 
all of Hamilton will know about the murder of Art Rosendahl. The neighborhood has been shaken by this murder. Oh, it's devastated. Uh, nice, quiet neighborhood. And whoever did this took it away from me. Hamilton police have a 22-year-old man in custody, charged with second-degree murder, but they're still on the lookout for the two remaining suspects. The other person that they're looking for, he would have known if he was in Hamilton that his friend, Carol Sparks, was arrested that night. He would have heard that on the news. So the answer is, leave the city. The police continue to pursue their strongest suspect, Cairo Sparks. If they can build their case against him, perhaps he'll give up his associates. Annette Hughes works the forensic evidence. All the exhibits that I seized from the crime scene, you know, once they're photographed, collected, I get them back into our lab, and each exhibit, depending on what it is, I go through a process of the best way to deal with the evidence. And I collected several fingerprints, one from the shot glass. There are a couple of fingerprints on a beer mug. To her surprise, Cairo's fingerprints do not match any found at the crime scene. We follow avenues of the investigation, and some, some things work out, and some things just don't. Meanwhile, witnesses are asked to identify Cairo Sparks in a photo array. As per police protocol, Sparks' mugshot is neutral, and he's not smiling. The distinctive metal grills in his mouth are not visible. Photo array are not always successful. Some witnesses cannot remember or don't want to remember or don't want to get involved. Cairo Sparks is not identified. It's a concern for us that we can't identify him in the bar. When he wasn't picked out, it was sort of um, sent us back a bit reeling. Now police are relying on the Center for Forensic Sciences to fast track the blood work on Sparks' boot. You're hounding the forensic scientists and you're saying, look it. This is big, you know. We need to know whether this is Mr. Rosendahl's uh, DNA. But another blow is dealt. And then all of a sudden, you get knocked down again. And they, they said, no, it's not. The blood on Sparks's boot does not belong to Art Rosendahl. Police are confounded by the lack of solid evidence. Their instincts are telling them that Sparks was one of the three men in the bar. Right off the beginning, we, we had a gentleman arrested a short distance, match the description, has teeth grills on. From the moment police first encountered Cairo Sparks, he has behaved as if he's guilty. He was just aggressive from uh, the word go, right from the time the officer approached him on the street, right to the point where we had to use um, some uh, extra force to seize evidence for a murder, to right down, taking him downstairs into our uh, holding cells. Unless more evidence comes in, the police will have to drop the charges against Cairo Sparks. The Hamilton police request intel from their colleagues in Kitchener, Sparks' hometown, just an hour away. Monday morning when their intelligence officers came in, they did a whole background, said he belongs to a street gang here in Kitchener, the Kings. They are one of the bigger gangs, they're violent, they deal with drugs, and they have a symbol that they like to flash and let people know that the kings are here. Cairo Sparks is one of the kings, so maybe other members of the gang were there with him at the bar that night. So we started asking for associates and gave them descriptions, and right away, the one first officer said, well, the other fellow would be uh, Corey McLeod. Corey McLeod is a gang member with a record for assault who rolls with Cairo Sparks. This new information might reinvigorate the investigation. Now it was, where's Corey McLeod? We start looking, and when I talk to the security manager at uh, Hamilton Detention Center, he runs the names and says, well, Corey McLeod's up at Maplehurst. So immediately we're like, oh, I guess it's not Corey McLeod. He's doing time. Another dead end, and with each passing day, the case grows colder. Hamilton, Ontario. Detectives toil to catch the assailants who beat Art Rosendahl to death. Only one man is in custody, Cairo Sparks. Though Sparks matches an eyewitness description, the police have no other evidence against him. It's a concern for us that we can't identify him in the bar. The man Sparks is known to roll with, Corey McLeod, is in jail, so it seems that he is not a viable suspect. The case seems to be going cold before Art Rosendahl is even buried. 
Four days after the murder, 200 people attend Art's funeral. There's always the usual vigilante talk, and yeah, there was a lot of anger. I want them to be found so they don't do that to anybody else. These, for lack of a better term, punks can take a man's life away. <laughs> that certainly didn't deserve. The homicide unit is feeling the pressure. The uh, Hamilton uh, public was outraged as to what happened that particular night. A lot of media attention and a lot of um, get those guys. The police asked the family to make an appeal to the public. If there's somebody out there with a little bit more information, please come forward. If you have any information, call Crime Stoppers. The Crime Stoppers plea generates a flood of tips. We were getting people calling us, we were trying to help us. Most of the tips lead nowhere, but then there's a call that pays off. Someone called in at Crime Stoppers and said, uh, at 2 in the afternoon on Friday, I saw two guys fitting the description at the no frills at Upper James and uh, Mohawk. Right in the vicinity of O'Grady's on the afternoon of the murder. We went to the no frill store. We looked through all their video. Abi Rashet spots Cairo Sparks, and with him is his close associate. Sure enough, there is Mr. McLeod. We brought it up to Kitchener Waterloo, and they said, oh, yeah, that's Corey McLeod. Great footage. And what's hanging from his neck? Dog tags. Corey McLeod not only wears dog tags, he has a nickname, Damien P. We've received information that um, the dog tags with Damien P was given to him by an ex-girlfriend. And though Corey McLeod is now in jail for another crime, on the day of the murder, he was at large. We found out the day he turned himself in was the day after this happened. So he was out at the time when Arthur was beaten and murdered. Corey turned himself in on an outstanding warrant that he had from Kitchener, uh, basically the next day on the 15th. So we said, what better place to hide than in jail? It almost worked. Now it's up to Annette Hughes to put McLeod at the scene of the crime. Waterloo had dealt with McLeod and had his fingerprints on their system. And uh, I took what we had there, did my fingerprint compar comparison, and I knew 100% that, that it was him. The evidence puts McLeod at the bar. If the broken dog tag contains his DNA, it will link him to the beating of Art in the back hallway. I thought there was a really strong likelihood that we could get DNA from the chain. So now we're starting to get a picture. We're starting to shape this investigation. McLeod's is associated with Cairo. They're both from Kitchener. The description of McLeod and Cairo and the bar seem possible. So it's starting to come together. But what's the motive? Maloney wants to know what the men were doing in Hamilton that night. Let's see who's visiting Cairo in jail. He's had two visitors, two girls. One said they were the girlfriend of Cairo, and the other one said just a friend. Katrina McLennan, Cairo's girlfriend, rents an apartment in Hamilton. You find out the address is on Upper James, which is like within 500 feet of the O'Grady's bar. It connects. And her roommate, Sherry Foreman, is involved with Corey McLeod. So we wanted to go up and see them, and we had met them, and they basically had no respect for the police. The girls claim to know nothing. I still am shocked that they didn't uh, break down, cry, crack under pressure. Basically, we got nowhere with them other than uh, we know them from Kitchener, but they've never been to our apartment in Hamilton. The police don't believe them. Our fella had seen two black guys jump over a fence, which basically backs on to the apartment where the girls live. Greg and I actually said, well, let's go up and put some pressure on the parents of the girls. Maybe the parents will say, hey, you got to tell the police what they want to know. You got to tell them the truth. Sherry's parents tell police the girls are vacating their suite as they speak. Police head directly to the apartment building. They had moved out. Katrina's dad had come down and, and packed up her stuff. We thought, ah, oh, you know, there's the valley. Ah, we didn't get here in time. It seems any evidence that may have been in the apartment is now lost. But the building super tells police the girls didn't quite take everything with them. He says, but there's some garbage bags out back. The detectives get down to some dirty work. So, like, all the years on the job, I've gone through more garbage 
I said, oh, great, more garbage. Okay, bring it in, we'll go through it. I think it was the first bag we went through, and there was bills and receipts to identify that it was Katrina's uh, stuff in, in her garbage. I got a call from the guys. Uh, they were downstairs in our security garage and said, uh, grab your camera. You might want to come down here and see something. In the garbage bag, a pair of shoes. Detective Hughes flips one over. As soon as I saw it, I just knew. I knew that was the cause of the injuries on Art Rosendahl. The tread on the sole of the shoe is an exact match for the bruise on Art Rosendahl's back. I think what she did was amazing. This bruising on Art's back, but they couldn't tell what it was. And she figured it out was the boot print. The pattern on the bottom of the shoes explained everything. It was, it was like the heavens opened up. That's a murder weapon. That's what we looked at as. In Hamilton, Ontario, it's been one month since Art Rosendahl was murdered in a bar. Two men were seen kicking and beating the victim, and a third was present during the attack. Police are holding Cairo Sparks on the charge of second-degree murder. A second suspect, Corey McLeod, is in jail for another crime. So far, the police don't have the forensic evidence they need to prove murder. We have a real good circumstantial case, which uh, in a homicide may not be the weight you need. They are counting on running shoes found in the garbage to solidify their case. We had the item that caused the injuries on his back, and we knew that whoever was wearing those shoes was responsible for doing them. In my opinion, it was huge. If the DNA in the shoes can be identified, there will be concrete evidence against at least one of the perpetrators of this vicious attack. There's an, always an opportunity to get wear DNA from shoes. Sometimes it can be difficult uh, if someone always wears their socks. On the basis of the shoes, police search the new homes of the suspect's girlfriends, looking for more evidence. We found a duffel bag up in Cherry's room, and in that duffel bag are some clothing and, and, a, and a writing book or doodle book that she says it's Corey's stuff. The bag contains a letter with the word red rum and a disturbing sketch. It was uh, one of those things where it seems like time stops. I was looking down at a sketch of three stick figures with crowns, and it appeared that they were stomping another figure on the ground. Here's a picture of what they did to Art that night in a drawing book in McLeod's bag. So here's that connection. The sketch suggests an intent to kill. It's either you drew it and that's what you intended to do to somebody, or you drew it after because you're basically bragging to yourself, well, look what we did. And it's also a reminder that the third man in the attack is still at large. Katrina McLennan and Sherry Foreman are arrested as accessories after the fact to murder. I think it, in their eyes, they were doing the right thing. They were being loyal to their men. And Annette Hughes gets the long-awaited test results that put Cairo Sparks at the scene of the crime. His DNA is on a drinking glass. Every court case that I've been to in recent years, I think a jury would be shocked if we didn't have some sort of DNA evidence. Now, can forensics prove the case against McLeod? The DNA test shows conclusively that the dog tag is his, but it also reveals other vital evidence, the DNA of someone else. CFS was able to um, not only get Corey's DNA off of the dog tag, but also Art Rosendahl's. Art uh, somehow uh, must have grabbed the uh, dog tags during the struggle but the most incriminating piece of evidence is from the shoes. DNA results prove the shoe that caused the distinctive bruising on Art's back belonged to Corey McLeod. I can't even imagine how much force it would take to basically take the pattern off the bottom of your shoe and, and put it on somebody's body. That just shows the, the trauma uh, and the force used to assault him. They had to know the damage that they were causing. They, they may have even had to know that you can kill somebody by doing this. It's game over for the man known as Damien P. Corey McLeod is charged on March 9th, 2005. But the police still don't have a complete picture of the murder. Key questions remain, like who was the third man? 
A paid informant with ties to the gang provides police with the name of a young offender who watched but was not part of the attack. Could he have done more? Could he have gone for help or had them stop? Perhaps. But we felt that those two adults that actually inflicted um, those blows to Art were the ones responsible for his death. Finally, the police want to know why Art Rosendahl was murdered. The informant provides the elusive motive. Out in the pool area earlier, two black guys were arguing with each other. Somehow it carries on into the washroom. Mr. Rosendahl, we believe, um, walked into the washroom as they were arguing. He tried to calm the situation down inadvertently, and this anybody would do this was to, you know, put your uh, hand uh, on someone's arm. He put his hand on Cairo's shoulder and said, hey, we don't need this, guys. The instant that Mr. Rosendell touched one of those individuals, to them was a sign of disrespect. With that, Cairo turned around and started hitting him. We know there's a struggle, that dog tag, you know, whether it was a, a grab of desperation or if he was, you know, trying to push him back. Corey jumped in and they laid the boots to him. It paints a very violent picture of, of his last minute. They turned on him like, uh, you know, rabid dogs. When he was down on his stomach, then that's when they were kicking and stomping and, you know, jumping on his back. And that's what it was. It was, he disrespected me. The police have worked hard to build a case for second degree murder, but if they can't prove intent, the perpetrators could get away with it. Bar fight usually ends up being a manslaughter charge. Um, you have to show the intent. Uh, fights end up being very hard to prove that it was an actual murder. It's not about the truth, it's about the proof. Can you prove intent? Can we prove intent in court? It's a scary proposition. You you may have to roll the dice. What are we going to do here? Take a plea to manslaughter because we know we've got a conviction or do we push for second degree? The defense offers up a guilty plea to the lesser charge of manslaughter. The Crown accepts. Sparks and McLeod are sentenced to 11 years, close to the maximum. It's a year before anyone touches Art's locker at the steel mill. There's a picture of Art that one of the fellows did a portrait hanging on a wall. Every time you walk around a corner and you see that thing, it's like somebody gives you a, a kick in the chest. He was always a peacemaker. Always wanted to people to get along. Art's youngest son has taken on the restoration of his 67 Buick. The car in the garage, maybe one day the car will be done. Then I'll drive it. Then I'll drive it right down to Woodland Cemetery and show that she's done. For Art's loved ones, 11 years for manslaughter is an insufficient penalty. Anything less than a murder charge just wasn't acceptable to any of us. He was my love of my life, and some asshole, pardon the language, took that from me. There is no closure. You could get 25 years for the person that killed your loved one. That will still not be enough. Sparks and McLeod are due to be released seven years after the murder. They will not serve their full sentences. Mm -hmm.